Welcome to the Once in Future Authors Podcast. I'm Stephanie, and I'm so delighted today to be joined by author Christina Hope. She's written so many wonderful things. I don't think we're going to have time in a half hour to talk about everything, but uh, Girl on the Brink um, and Skin of Tattoos are two fabulous books, especially for women to be reading, and I, you'll hear why. Uh, Christina comes to writing from journalism, so her books are, you know, fiction, but so, so very true because her research is just outrageous. So, Christina, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, well, thank you for having me, Stephanie. I am thrilled, and, and such important topics you hit in Girl on the Brink and Skin of Tattoos. Would you mind giving us, you know, just a little synopsis, shall we say, or, or theme of each, just so our, our listeners understand? Yeah, uh, well, Girl on the Brink is about, uh, is a YA novel, but actually I have a lot of adult women reading it, frankly, um, and it's about dating violence. And it's actually based on something I went through, an abusive relationship. And in the aftermath of that, I really wanted to write, being a writer, I write about things that happened to me. Um, so I wanted to write about it, but I made it a YA because I just felt that not uh, enough people, uh, particularly women, know the red flag signs of an abusive relationship. And once you know what they are, they're very clear, you know, they jump out at you. But the problem is they can be really misinterpreted as other things. And that's what happened to me. And nobody teaches you this stuff. So, you know, this, this book is about, a, it's a novel about a, a girl who gets involved with the wrong guy. She's a 17 year old, uh, you know, wannabe reporter. She's doing a summer internship and meets this guy, he gets swept off her feet. And he soon starts revealing his dark and troubled side. And then she has to extricate herself from the relationship safely. And she, you know, she does a bit of a spoiler, but yes, she does. And there is hope at the, you know, it all's well that ends well. Too. Well, as, as the mother of a daughter and a woman myself, I'm so thrilled that you're hitting on such a uh, important topic. I mean, dating violence is huge and I'm sorry that you went through it, but I'm so glad that you channeled it into being able to present this to other people. Like you said, see the red flags. You know, it's, yeah, it's it's one of those things. It's actually incredibly common. And whenever I've spoken about this book, I mean, it can be just to a writing group or, you know, a book club or a couple of times I've also spoken at women's groups about specifically about domestic violence. But even when the topic isn't that I just talk about the book, I get people coming up afterward, uh, you know, sometimes with tears in their eyes crying, saying this happened to me. I'm so glad you're writing about it. And um, you know, and as I said, a lot of women have bought the book to read or to give to daughters, granddaughters, nieces, you know, what have you. And, and you're so right. We don't talk about that. You know, uh, my own daughter, I certainly didn't sit down and say, so if you notice this, this or this, these, these are red flags. I never had that conversation. But when you can give someone mm -hmm. a book like Girl on the Brink and have them read it, and get themselves immersed in the story and then start to realize, oh, I'm seeing that. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of like a cautionary tale, but wrapped in a very suspenseful tale, you know, story. So hopefully it's entertaining, but, you know, underneath there's a message, there is a message underneath, although I tried to make it, you know, suspenseful and entertaining and, and everything. Exactly. Um, and but it's also about breaking through that silence, the shame and the, the judgment, you know. Exactly, and it was just released in Spanish, is that? Yes, and uh, so this is a second edition. I've got a new publisher. I got my rights back, with, uh, got with the new publisher. So this is a much improved uh, edition with books club uh, discussion questions, and I revised, you know, a few different things. You know, second editions are great because then you can go back and like fix stuff. You're like, oh no, you know, when you see it in print. And I had it translated into, into Spanish too. So it's called Chica al Borde and that's uh, coming out. Um, well, the, the Kindle version's already on Amazon, but it's um, also coming out in paperback and hardback. Fantastic. Tell me a little bit about your book club discussion questions. Do you have a lot of book clubs? Do you visit book clubs yourself as an author? How, how does that have worked out for you? I do belong to a, a book club. Um, so, you know, and, and uh, I have done like just a couple book club things by Zoom. Um, it's very handy for book club appearances where people read your book and then they ask you about it. So I just put 10 questions in the back of the book, just about the book and, uh, you know, what they 
perhaps things that might make them think uh, about the theme and that kind of thing. Fantastic. Characters. Now, you don't speak Spanish yourself, do you? I do, actually. It's, uh, you know, a second language, but I lived in, in Spanish-speaking countries oh, for 10 fantastic. years in Spain, Guatemala, and Venezuela, so, and worked as a, I was a foreign correspondent, actually, in um, Latin America. So, so you could I, use our translation. Well, it's, it's speaking things and, you know, doing literary things are very different, you know, that when, again, when things are on the page, you know, black and white, the mistakes just kind of jump out at you and you think, oh, but uh, when you speak it and you make a mistake, you just kind of go, you know, <laughs> ramble on, you know, past it, you know, it's not, not so noticeable. So my, I don't think my written Spanish was up to the, quite up to the, but um, I, I certainly I can speak. I'd be terrified to be a foreign correspondent in a foreign language. Like I'd start a war by accident. You, you make uh, it sound like <laughs> you say something wrong, you just kind of slip right over it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But mostly, you know, if you can get the questions down and let them talk. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, all this time in Venezuela and such, did that influence your writing, any of your books? Yeah, well, actually, the other book, Skin of Tattoos, was directly sort of inspired by a story I did in El Salvador. Um, I was assigned a magazine story uh, to write about, um, they were gang members who had grown up, they were born in El Salvador, and they were went with their families fleeing the Civil War in El Salvador in the 80s and early 90s to Los Angeles. And when they got here and, and grew up in inner city urban uh, neighborhoods, they formed gangs, you know, because there were other ga other gangs in the in the area. So they formed their own Salvadoran gangs. And then in the late 90s, the US government started deporting, uh, really cracking down on immigrants with criminal records. So that affected a lot of these, these guys, and they got deported back to El Salvador, um, which they had left in many cases as babies or infants, toddlers, young children. Some of them barely spoke Spanish. And again, not a formal Spanish enough to like read or, you know, uh, conduct a lot of formal transactions with. So they really were like fish out of water. So, um, and what did they do? They formed their own gangs, you know, again, because that's what they knew how to do. And that's basically was the, is the genesis of the huge gang problem in Central America today. But anyway, there's their stories stuck with me. And then when I later moved to Los Angeles, I covered gang issues for the Associated Press. And um, yeah, and I so I started writing Skin of Tattoos and that's the, the result of. Okay, so how, how from a writing perspective, you have, you have gang violence and you have dating violence. Yes, the word violence is in both, but they're, radically different in, in type and genre. Did you approach them differently when you were writing or did you find more in common than different? Um, yeah, they were kind of different. I had to do a lot more research. I mean, I still had to do research for Girl on the Brink and read up on domestic violence and, and a lot of different things. But obviously I had to do a lot more research uh, for Skin of Tattoos. Um, so I, you know, I had to really bone up on a, a lot of that stuff. Um, and as I said, I did do a lot of interviews for my work as a journalist and, and reporting. And I did write a book um, on gang intervention, which is the, which is using former gang members to, to break the cycle of violence with the current back gang members. And it's called Peace in the Hood um, with a gang interventionist. So I had a pretty good grounding in it. And then I just had to kind of, you know, come up with the plot and the characters. And that, that was really a lot of fun. I really loved my characters in the in Skin of Tattoos. Wow. So uh, what was it, what's next for you? Is it going to be something related? Is there another YA? Is it completely off the chart here? Well, it's going to be another <laughs> story of violence, I suppose. Uh, it's a mystery. Um, and this deals with, um, it's, it's going to be an adult mystery, but it refers to things that happen in high school 10 years later. Um, and it'll be a girl, a young woman who's, you know, searching for what happened to her one night when she feels she was sexually assaulted, but she has no memory of it. So she wants to find out what happened to her that one drunken night. And at the same time, there's a, a podcast a, 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 about a cold case murder in the same town involving a a, a student from the same high school. So these two sort of plot lines interweave and I, I, I can't tell too much, I don't want to spoil it. Not too plot, much. But they interweave and kind of collide at the end. Absolutely, you can't tell too much, but gosh, I hear so much darkness from you and yet you're so bubbly and lovely and uh, 
<laughs> I know. Well, people say, like, why do you write so dark? And I don't know. I think it's having been a, a you know a reporter, a journalist for 30 years. I wrote about a lot of stuff, you know, bad stuff that happens in life for no good reason, basically. You know, that that's really, you know, news when you yes, think about it. Yeah. The nature of news is is bad, you know. So I wrote about a lot of bad stuff for that happens for no good reason, as I said. <laughs> now is that what you re if you're reading for pleasure or watching movies, do you you tend toward the dark or I do tend toward that I like I like drama and I like a lot of conflict um I love dramedy too so I like uh I do have a couple short stories I've, I've written in sort of a funny uh dramedy kind of a, a voice and uh, I have to, I, you know I'd like to do more of that and I do love literary fiction too with family sagas and that kind of thing and I hope to do a, a novel about that too one day Wow, how many things do you have on your, you know, in your notepad right now? If 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 time were no problem and you could just, if there was, let's say, a lockdown and you had time, what would you write next? I know, I, I have tons of things. I do have a notebook um, that I, you know, write down all my ideas and things that I want to write. And I, and I go over it periodically and see how things would fit. Or sometimes you can, you know, put two ideas into one, one book, but... Um, yeah, it's all, it, it, they, you know, the thing is with novels, they just take a long time, you know, for me, I, I don't know, you know, some people seem to be able to churn them out. I, uh, they're painstaking for me, you know, I just, it's just developing the plot, the characters, the whole world. It, it's Now, how does that work for you? Are you developing them? Are they developing themselves? Do you need to give them time to breathe and grow so that uh, they can come right off of your fingers. How does the writing process work for you in a novel? It, you know, if they do start to write themselves, it's funny you say that, um, because I have an idea in my head and then really, and I try and outline it and I try to, you know, write down character sketches and all this stuff, but it really doesn't work that way. It, it just, they, they, it just develops when, as I'm writing, that's when I get the most ideas is when I'm writing. And it's, it's strange, you know, it's just funny because I, I sit down to write, okay, I'm going to write you know, you know, really detailed outline about something. And it just, you know, it always just seems very contrived, but when I'm actually writing, the ideas start flowing. So that's maybe, I guess, why it takes me so long to. Well, I think there. it's like a relationship. I mean, quite frankly, you are having a relationship with your characters and you need time to get to know them. I mean, if, if you and I just met, and even if we gave each other, you know, a list of 10 questions to, to know more about each other, we're not gonna be best friends by the end of the, you know, 15 minutes, right. all the questions. You need time, you know, for, especially if you're hoping that the characters are going to reveal themselves to you. And uh, sometimes you need that time because a character might not go where you think they were going to go. Has that happened in exactly. your Exactly, yeah. Oh, oh, all the time, you know. And again, they start, that, that's just such a great analogy that, you, <laughs> that you, you came. Yeah, it is. It's like getting to know someone. You have this idea of them. And then as they start going through their paces in the plot, they start doing different things. And sometimes they can... Um, to other things. I mean, like in Skin of Tattoos, my, my main guy, who's it's a first person narrative, Mags, um, who wants to get out of the gang and then he gets call, call, pulled back into it. But I also incorporated, you know, his sister was a victim of domestic violence. So he takes her to a uh, support group, you know, and he's very protective of women. So I incorporated that little thing into his character as well. Right, so. and, and, and even in, in Girl on the Brink, you know, I'm sure that they dated for a certain amount of time. She thought she knew him, you know? Right. Right. Sometimes you really think you know someone and you really don't until circumstances yeah. change. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right, yeah. You know, so uh, when you're starting a new idea, are you one of the, uh, I'm gonna make a detailed outline scene by scene by scene by scene, or you're like, all right, I got six months, let's just write a novel and see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of both. You know, I've, I've this with this novel that I'm working on now. I've tried to be more rigorous with an outline, and usually, whenever I've I've started out with an outline, then I I, I veer from it, and then I and then I just kind of abandon it. <laughs> <laughs> 
so which is not the purpose of an outline. So I'm like, okay, this time I'm going to actually like stick to the outline. And when I make a change in the writing that I've got to go back to the outline and change the outline and see how it's going to go. So I'm trying to be a little more orderly in the way I write. So actually this morning I was actually working on rearranging the outline instead of just plunging in and moving text around. Um, and then you get lost, you know, and then it takes you a while to like find your way again. So the outline really can be a good map. So Although, it, with if as you say, you end up throwing it away at some point anyway, I'm sure there are listeners saying, well, then why bother making the outline? So exactly, you know, exactly. So that's been my thing. So this time I've tried to make better use of, of, of outlining. And, and well, I don't, I don't know, a bunch of successful novels and she's saying, this time I'm gonna use an outline. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was hoping it would speed the process too, you know, it was like, but it don't, doesn't really don't break it, you know, don't, don't mm -hmm. uh, tamper if it's actually working for you. Well, do you think that people who write faster, I mean, I guess this is a multi-part question. A, is that better? Um, I mean, I guess from a perspective of the more you write, the more you publish, the more, you know, books out there. Um, so I guess, you know, financially it's better if you write faster. But um, do you actually think that people who are writing faster, for example, are they are their characters as developed, or are they perhaps writing with teams? Do they have groups of people who are, you know, making it all happen a little bit more? Because it does sometimes take, you know, you have editors and all sorts of things, I'm sure. Right. I mean, some people, you know, like James Patterson often co-writes with someone, you know, yeah. basically somebody else does the great grunt work. I think he comes up with a story and says, okay, write this, this you know, right. um, and other, you know, novelists very successful that churn out novels every year. And what I have noticed is there's, you know, sometimes you notice a little bit of sloppiness in the writing that it's not quite as tight. And I, you know, I tend to be a little bit more, I like, literary writing. I'm really into literary writing. So I do tend to take a lot of care over crafting sentences and things. And I don't think if you're, you know, under really tight deadlines, I don't, I think that's what really goes out the window. It's just kind of, you know, you just got to get those, the story down and the character, you know, and, and finish the, the project and hand it in. Right. Whereas I, I tend to like to really kind of go over it and make sure it's beautiful prose. <laughs> Although is a deadline a good thing or a bad thing with you? I mean, I know for myself, if there's no deadline, nothing's ever gonna happen. Like, I like a deadline, but maybe not so aggressive. How about you? Is, it, is a deadline a good thing or a bad thing for you? I like deadlines, you know, I, and actually, you know, working in journalism for 30 years, I'm t totally used to me, you know, to, to writing on deadline and writing fast. And there's something your adrenaline gets going, you got to meet that deadline, you're pounding the keys, uh, you know, in the newsroom, you know, in a, with a novel, it's not quite as intense. But um, yeah, I, I, I like deadlines, too. I think they, I, I think they really can spur you on. Now, what about more than one book at a time? Do you write one at a time? Or do you have multiple projects going? Well, what I like to do is finish a draft and then I set it aside, work on something else and then come back to the first draft. And um, so sometimes I do have, you know, different things and that's when I can write a short story or a novella right. um, in between different things, you know, essays, things like that. And then I go back to the, to the novel. This, the novel I'm working on now though, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, stay on, on top of it and just get it done. Right, right. Just keep plowing ahead with it. Yeah. Just uh, not yeah, only yeah, I'm sure. shorten that time and, and uh, just get it done. Yeah. Now, if you could have somebody like a James Patterson who has a whole team, what would you want? Would you want a cleanup person? Would you want a researcher? Would you want someone who can just spin a good sentence? What's that one thing that, you know, maybe, oh, if I had one of those, I can turn these out to a year. <laughs> Um, you know, a researcher would be really good, um, or someone who can, um, you know, discuss plot. Uh, that's, you know, my, you know, sometimes you get stuck on how am I going to get over this hurdle. So someone to, to, who's good on plot uh, stuff would be really good to discuss plot and oh. figure out what characters are going to go, where they're going to do next, you know. So. <laughs> now, uh, I know you're, we're from the land of Down Under, aren't you originally from New Zealand? I am. I was born in New Zealand. I actually grew up around the world and um, grew up in, in Australia was one another place I grew up and then I came to New Jersey when I was 13. 
Oh, okay. So where else you were? Australia and New Zealand? You said around the um, world. Well, I'll give you the whole. I'll give you the whole story, Stephanie. Well, you said any other places. The long version. <laughs> Um, my parents met in Central Africa, and it was then called Northern Rhodesia. It's now Zambia. My mother was an English nurse, and my father was a mining engineer, and they met in a copper mining town um, near the Congo border called Mafalira. Uh, and my mother was a nurse at the mine hospital. They met and, and married, and then I was almost going to be born there. I, I would have actually, I was on track to be being born in Africa. And they left and went to New Zealand and that's where I was born. And then three weeks later, we were off to Fiji to work at a, my dad had a, a job at a gold mine on the main island of Fiji. We were there for a while. Then we, he got a job uh, with a Swedish multinational mining equipment sort of uh, manufacturer. So we went to Sweden and then to England um, where my mother's from, as I said, and then we went to Lagos, Nigeria and then back to New Zealand, to Wellington, New Zealand, which is where I started school and my memory sort of, you know, I can remember that. And then we went to Sydney, Australia. And then when, as I said, 13, we came to New Jersey. So. Wow. Considering that I currently live five miles from the hospital where I was born, that just sounds so amazing. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, it's, it's, your, you know, that what you just said always seems to me like idyllic, you know, like to grow up in the same place and know the same kids you from kindergarten to <laughs> 12th grade, you know, that would be, you know, you just know everyone. It's like comforting, you know. I guess. I mean, oh, it is New York City, so it is kind of big, right. but still. But still, yeah. I mean, literally have never moved more than five miles from the hospital where I was born. So I'm hearing all this. My gosh, that's a book right there. Uh, any thoughts about writing about uh, other places far and wide, or is that not uh, in your bag of tricks? Yeah, I would love to do that. I don't think, you know, I've been told by literary agents that um, books about international locations don't sell very well in the United States. Um, so that's put me off. And I, I have written a novella actually, you know, um, based, set in the uh, Amazon jungle. And um, that's out, out at a couple of publishers now on submission. So we'll see where that goes. And, but I'm trying to, I want to incorporate more international stuff into my stories, you know. Yeah, yeah. well, especially with your background. I mean, you have a, a passport with a lot of stamps in it. I would think that that would make its way into your book. <laughs> yeah, it gives you more, you know, I give my characters, I think different backgrounds. You know, I can make them like one I'm in the work on the book I'm writing now, I have a, a character who's uh, father was a, is a dissident in Hong Kong, so they had to, you know, leave Hong Kong because the Chinese government was cracking down on, on the father. You know, things like that, which uh, right. sort of give different, interesting backstories to characters and things. Absolutely. Now, people come to writing from so many different places. I I met someone this morning who was you know, a history teacher, and he started writing. Uh, someone else I met earlier was a wrestler. That was my <laughs> first wrestler and started writing. Now, uh, you come from journalism, which I would guess is a path that a lot of people might like, but what are, what are things that are so different? You know, like here you are, you're a trained journalist, you've been all over the world. Yeah, it's nothing like writing a novel. What would you say for that young journalist who says, yeah, I'd like to be a writer? What's different that they should be aware of? Well, one of the key differences is as a journalist, you don't put any kind of emotion in your stories. You know, you tell the facts, just the facts, ma'am. And, um, and you sort of write an impartial story. You know, it's a very neutral voice, you know, and you, you know, say this is the good side and this is the bad side on, of an issue and, and whatnot. What about similarities between the two? Is, is journalism actually a good way to go in? Like a lot of people who, when they're young, they say, I'd love to be a novelist someday. And and that's really hard when you're 18, thinking you want to be a novelist. I always think you need to live a little bit first. But right, right. You know, I think it, it, I think it's good training. I mean, it gets you a discipline to in to write. You know, you write every day. You write. You know, you, and and it, and it really you can you learn how to write clearly, concisely, tightly. Um, you know, very strict word lengths and uh, your word. You know, uh, inch. They, they used to call it go by the column inch in a newspaper. Mm -hmm. 
um, things like that. So those are really great. You also get very used to being critiqued because everything goes through editors, you know, and, and sometimes more than usually more than one editor and they'll call you up at midnight and say, hey, I've got a question on your story, you know. Uh, so you get used to sort of being edited and rejected and, you know, some, some things work, some things don't. So, and I think that's a really good thing to have actually, especially when you start out and you think, oh, my, you know, my, my story is precious and somebody comes along and, and you, you know, gets slammed. <laughs> so, um, you know, these, so, you know, different things like that, I think is really good. And plus you also know what's a, what a story is. You learn as a, as a journalist, you learn to recognize what a story, you know, what's a good story. So, um, and, I, and some people don't have a lot of good story sense. Yeah, well, no, you're absolutely right. I'm sure you can see like little tidbits of things and know, oh, that would be a great story. But since your stories are often have its basis in fact, um, do you have to be careful about that line? Like, do you, you know, keep your lights on at night because you write about gangs, for example, or anything like that? Is that is that a worry that you're right there on the edge? Or uh, is that something that people have to think about with their stories? Um, I don't think so. To me, it doesn't, it hasn't affected me that way or at all. I just, I like de delving into different worlds, you know, and finding out how other worlds work and live and other people live. So, you know, that's always been, something that's always drawn me to journalism because it exposes you to so many different walks of life and, and so many different avenues in life that you would never, you know, see otherwise. Exactly. Is there some place that you haven't been yet that you want to dive into that world? Maybe like a little mini writer's retreat to prepare for another book? Where in the world? Um, I don't know. I just, I want to keep traveling. You know, I, I, I love travel. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this pandemic being over to getting back on a plane and traveling overseas and, and um, yeah, just looking at, you know, whatever I can, I can incorporate, you know, it's like grist for the mill. There's, there's no, there's no bucket list place that, Ooh, I didn't get this before the pandemic. I have to get it now. I like, I love really remote places. So I'd love to go to Mongolia and um, uh, Tibet. Those kind of, those, those are high on my list. Interesting. So, so she's into dark and remote. Those two <laughs> things together. <laughs> That's good. I, 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 I'm gonna, those are key words. I've got to like, hmm. Yeah, the you know, thing that happens in a remote place. Well, that's the thing. I'm hearing dark and remote together uh, with you. <laughs> that could sum up a, a whole lot of different tropes for your, your coming book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that is true. Yeah. Uh, do you work with other writers or advise people on what they can do to improve their own writing or get started? Workshop. Um, I give, um, yeah, I give, you know, courses, uh, you know, classes every now and then or speak to book groups, writing groups. I've done a lot of that um, in, the, in the past. And I'm, I'm sure I've, I've got actually one coming up in June is a um, sort of a, I don't know if you can call it a lecture or a class or something. And I've also got on Udemy, is it Udemy or a mini course. Yep. Uh, with Red Penguin about researching and also about just trying to decide what kind of story, how you want to tell your life story. Because that's actually what I get approached uh, with a lot is, you know, people wanting to write their memoir. You know, memoir is a huge genre uh, now. And you have to first decide what you're going to write, you know, how you're going to tell it and what you're going to write. And sometimes writing a small slice of your life is better than a, a, the whole thing. And Absolutely. And I think that people are not always very good at figuring out what, which small slice. Right, exactly. Exactly. So people go on it and I'm like, wait a minute. No, actually, this is really interesting. Why don't you write about this? And right, right. I'm sure that happens that people come to you and they tell you this whole story. And it was this one piece over here that you said, no, this is the, this is the good stuff. Yeah, this is this is the real story. And they're like, oh, really? And then they, yeah, that's the story. You know, don't try and tell too much. It, you're better to go deep on a smaller, uh, you know, a smaller slice of your of your life and your story. Right. Well, that that's fabulous advice right there. You know, so many people come to me and say, oh, I want to write, and I don't know where to get an idea. And I always say, gosh, you know. There are, the ideas are out there, just walk down the street and, and people who are open to them 
see the ideas that, that are just around them. But I love mm -hmm. the way you're phrasing this, that it's, it's not that it's all out there. It's a matter of how you're looking at a thing, you know, and what that slice is, because the whole thing might just be, you know, people in the grocery store. <laughs> but, but this little thing that's going on here with this one person, you know. Right, some people, you know, I mean, people have great stories from their lives and anecdotes, but it has to, you know, the best anecdote of the stories you have to tell are the things that change you, that, you know, you start out from it's one way in the beginning, you go through this, whatever it is, and then you come out the end a different person. If those are really the, the, the stories to write, you know. The memoir oh, that's the memoir to write um and and not just for a memoir you know you're talking about think of what that thing was that was life-changing that was mm -hmm. pivotal and that's exactly what you did in a fiction sense with girl on the brink yes. and you know you didn't write about all the other stuff that happens to a young girl you, you focused on this pivotal moment and that's so important for, for our listeners to hear is that, you know, first of all, don't think so big. The, 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 uh, the, the riches are in the niches, as they often say, you know, dig, dig deep, find mm -hmm. the story. And just like you did as an investigative journalist for so many years, um, you were, your job was to find those stories. Right. Right, exactly. And, and you do have to dig deep. And that's another thing that people sometimes don't realize about writing their life story is that you've got to get into the nitty gritty, you know, and, and put yourself out there. And for example, I, I briefly, I considered writing a memoir about my experience in the abusive relationship, but I just didn't, I just didn't want to do it. You know, I, I didn't want to put myself out there. And I thought, you know what, I'll just do it as a, you know, sort of semi-autobiographical novel. And it, and it worked, you know, it, it was a much better way for me to tell that particular story. Right. A fabulous advice for people that, you know, might want to tell a particular story. And you don't have to tell it first person memoir. You could no, tell it, all. you know, in a, in a fictionalized setting. And sometimes um, in that fictionalized setting, what's nice is that your heroine or hero gets to make maybe decisions that you wanted to make yourself. You know, you get exactly. To, you can either make things that, you know, that you wanted to happen or make things that you don't, didn't want to happen to make more, you know, amp up the, the dramatic conflict or the stakes or something. Right, right. You so, know, yes. many of us in, in real life, after an incident, we say, darn, I wish I would have said this or gosh, I had a perfect comeback after the fact. Write it as a fictionalized uh, memoir mm -hmm. kind of a thing. You get to do all those things right there in the book. Right. That's why on TV shows, they always say, they always know what to say. You know, they've always got the comebacks. Right, right. They always have the comebacks. <laughs> they all, TV characters always have the know what to They say. have script writers. Well, right. you're chock full of advice for writers out there. Um, and I'm so excited and I'm thrilled that you have your, your pictures of your books right behind you. Um, Skin of Tattoos and Girl on the Brink. ChristinaHogue.com is where you can find Christina. Besides, um, of course, all retail bookshops, online, offline, etc. But but please visit her there, ChristinaHogue.com, and you can um, sign up to find out more about what's coming out, book her for speaking engagements, learn more about her nonfiction books and her amazing career in journalism, and learn a little bit more about how you can get started writing. You're just amazing. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you, Stephanie. My pleasure and happy writing.